Hi, this is Dr. Sarah Satcher. Thanks for joining me here. And we are going to talk today about diabetes. Um, we are going to talk about actually more specific, more specifically, diabetic foot. And uh, if you haven't already seen some of my videos talking about diabetes, um, I'm sure they'll be linked below. And also, um, after this video, you'll probably see some of those pop up. So uh, without further ado, um, this is the title slide that I used, I think, when we were talking about diabetes before, but health is wealth. So if you don't take care of your body, you're going to end up losing money and losing some of your wealth because if not all of your wealth because losing your health is expensive so we want to do what we can to maintain our health so you know what's what's unique about diabetes is that it affects the small blood vessels and the small blood vessels reside in the feet and in the hands and also in the organs that have to do with sexual functioning and uh, fertility. And also those small blood vessels reside in our eyes and in our kidneys. So what happens in diabetes is that those small blood vessels get clogged up. Now, before we thought once that damage happened that we couldn't do anything about it and that it was going to be permanent. However, now we're seeing with some of our new technology that we're using in functional medicine that we can get some of that to reverse. That's not what you're going to hear in conventional medicine where there is so much money made off of diabetes and cancer and the end stages cause things like problems with the heart, problems with uh, people losing their limbs in diabetes, losing their kidney function, losing brain function, having strokes. There's all kinds of things that happen when the circulation and the nervous system are affected. And diabetes affects also the endocrine and hormonal system. So pretty much every system in the body starts to downshift and not work properly. So what we're aiming to do here is, first of all, we want to recognize what's going on. We want to pay attention. And then we want to get some help. And when we're seeking help, we have to look for specific help that's going to help this problem. Um, and it's never too late to get healthy. Now, when it comes to diabetic feet and these other organs that I talk, uh, talked about that can be affected by the circulation being affected by diabetes and the nervous system being affected, sometimes you can go too far and you can let it go too long. And then there's no choice but to... Um, have to go to what we call the tertiary level of treatment, which is, you know, like chopping off your foot or your leg more commonly um, to save the rest of your body from the toxins that start accumulating when the tissue starts dying. So many times I, I was in internal medicine for a while. I practice in physical medicine and rehabilitation I also ran a clinic where we were practicing hyperbaric medicine um, and trying to save limbs. However, the limb can get too far and what's happening is there's cell death. So the tissue is actually dying because there's no circulation. And when you get to that point, the best that you can do at that point is to try to save part of the limb. A lot of times people think that, say for instance, when the foot is affected, they think it's the circulation in the foot that's only affected. But 
what happens in diabetes is affecting all the blood vessels all over the body at the same time. So when they start taking pictures of the circulation in the foot, there can be disease going all the way up to the aorta and to the heart. So literally the vascular surgeon is trying to, it's like he's a plumber and he's trying to reroute circulation. But if there's nothing to reroute it to, then he has no choice. Uh, mm -hmm. But he and the general surgeon probably have to decide where the amputation is going to be. And a lot of times from the rehab perspective in trying to help you with the recovery, and I'm just talking about this right up front because I'm sure that some of the people that are clicking on this probably have gangrene in their toes or in their feet. And they're trying to figure out how can I save, we call that limb salvage, how can I save my foot? Well, if your circulation is crappy all the way up to your pelvis, your best bet is to talk to your team. You need to have rehab doctors. You need to have vascular surgeon. You might need a foot surgeon. You might need an ortho foot ankle surgeon. If you're near an academic center, you can find one of those. And you may also need an endocrinologist and you may need a nutritionist, and you may not be able to turn around your diabetes fast enough in order to be able to save the limb, but you doggone you do need to try. And especially if you have wounds on your feet, you really need to try and do as much as you can. You know, is it more... Does it mean more to you to drink beer or to eat pizza than to have a foot? Does it mean more to you to eat a candy bar than to have a toe? This is what we need to think about. We need to get real. This is serious when we're getting to this stage. Even the early stages that I'm going to talk about is getting serious, okay? and you have to make some choices. So it's never too late to get healthy. All right. And if you have questions, please post the questions here. I love to answer questions. Um, I'm sure a lot of people wanna know, like, what makes you the expert, you know? And I did mention that previously I was, uh, or I'm still, board certified in rehab medicine. So I have a lot of experience with taking care of people that have uh, these beginning stages, the end stages when I was running a hyperbaric wound care center. Um, I started wound care center at the rehab hospital where I was. I also see a lot of people who don't even realize that they have diabetes in my functional medicine um, practice. And I've seen people that look like they're healthy, like runners who have some of these diabetic foot changes and no one has called their attention to it because nowadays people aren't even examining people when they come in clinically. So the people that are most likely to see these changes in the feet are going to be like physical therapists because most times they have people take off their shoes when they examine them, especially the first time. It's going to be rehab doctors because rehab doctors most likely are going to have people take off their shoes because we're looking at bone alignment and structure. A lot of times the chiropractors have people take off their shoes because they're also looking at bone alignment and structure. Um, orthopedic surgeons, depending on what you're complaining about, if it's in the lower extremities, they may have you take off your shoes. Um, dermatologists, when they're examining the skin, sometimes they'll have people take off their shoes, but not necessarily. So um, a lot of times, 
people that do uh what do you call it uh pedicure a lot of times the the estheticians or the um cosmetologists that do the um pedicures or manicures will see changes either in your hair or your skin or the nails and they'll call attention to it and tell you you should go see a doctor and they won't give you a diagnosis but they do know what the diagnosis is but they're not licensed to do that so they will tell you oh you might have problems with your hormones or with your sugars you should go see a doctor um, or they may not give you that much information, but you should heed their advice because they are licensed uh, and they're part of the health professional team, as far as I'm concerned, because they see some of the first changes. So in this slide, you can see a picture of uh, what a healthy foot looks like um, here, and you can see uh, what uh, a diseased foot starts looking like. And I'll point out some things in some later slides here, but we want to pay attention to our skin. A lot of people don't inspect their feet and we really need to inspect the bottom of the feet because things can be happening there. We can have numbness before we start uh, developing disease there or start showing signs of infections or more advanced stages. Um, so we need to, they have in the drugstore, if you go and ask a pharmacist, they have mirrors that are like on kind of like a stick that if you can't bend over and use a mirror, um, there are mirrors that are on a stick that you can sit in your chair and you can just lift up your foot kind of like uh, this top one showing and you can put the mirror underneath your foot and then you can see what's going on. Um, but what we're concerned about is the circulation. As I mentioned, the smud, small blood vessels supply the skin, especially like on the bottom of the foot and the toes. And the circulation also supplies the nerves that supply that area. So if the circulation is affected and if there's narrowing or blockage uh, developing in these small, tiny, tiny microscopic blood vessels, um, and actually what happens is actual sugar starts to bind to the proteins in the wall of the blood vessel, and that causes uh, narrowing and clotting it's not just cholesterol. It's actually inflammation in the tissue of the blood vessel. Uh, and it's in a structure that's called the glycocalyx. They've only discovered this uh, recently. Uh, however, we knew that sugar was hooking on to the proteins. We just didn't know what all was happening after that happened, but there is inflammation and damage being caused there are cytokines or chemicals that are going in from the immune system. There's a whole host of things that are ha happening and it happens gradually over time. So with circulation, we're looking for this pinkness of the skin on the bottom of the foot. We're also looking for the color in the foot. Uh, you can see this, this person's foot has a healthy color. Um, it's not pale. It looks like it has circulation. If you press on that with your finger, it blanches white and then it comes within seconds, it turns pink again. So that's what we're looking for. If there's a delay in it turning pink, then that's that tissue is not that healthy. We're also looking for the muscles in the feet uh, to be healthy. And when you look at this, Foot, you can see that they're starting to develop what we call hammer toes. And that will develop when, you know, a lot of people believe that, oh, my toes were too long and that my feet are making the toes curl up. Well, that can happen over time too. However, this problem is you can see that the knuckles on the toe are a little bit shiny. Um, there's a little bit of pinkness going on at the toenail here, and the toenails are discolored. We're going to talk about that too.
But what happens is you get shortening of the ligaments uh, underneath the toe. Um, and that's where the muscles are connecting to the bone that gets shortened. And so that toe will start to curl up. Eventually this knuckle will be curled up like, like this. And then the distal part of the toe will be like this. Sometimes it can all be like this. So it just depends on uh, how those ligaments and the muscles start to shorten on the underneath part of the toe is where there's shortening going on. Also, the nerves that cause all the tone in the muscle in the foot those nerves are starting to die because they're not getting circulation or the sheet that overlies the nerve is uh, losing its function. So it's basically like what we call denervation of the foot. The muscles that go in between the toes, we call those intrinsics, just like on the hands. And those muscles will start to atrophy. So you can start seeing the bones of the foot um, and the muscle is retracting back, okay? So this is a gradual change, but this affects the stability of the foot and you can get a foot that starts to drift in <clears throat> or drift out, it's more common for it to drift in. So the foot starts rolling in when the person's walking um, or they can develop flat feet where the muscles were holding the tone of the foot before, the foot can become flat um, and lack muscle tone. <clears throat> These are things that doctors can see. However, some doctors are more skilled at seeing this, such uh, that primary care is not as skilled at seeing this, but um, they would refer a person to a foot doctor or of an ankle ortho or physical medicine and rehab decide what's causing it. There are different things that can cause all of this. However, um, one of the most common things in the United States is diabetes. That's what, why we're talking about diabetic foot. People can also develop well uh, and on the foot, it could be the whole foot. It can get what we call stocking glove uh, neuropathy. And that's in the hand, that neuropathy goes up to the point where a glove would go, like just past the wrist. And in the foot, it's usually, you know, the whole foot can go at once and then it starts progressing up the leg and further up. So, um, when a person gets this, they can get it in both the hands and the feet, or it could just be the feet. It just all depends on, it's very individual. The health of the nails we need to pay attention to. When we have discoloration of the nails, a lot of times primary care doesn't recognize that this is highly likely to be fungal or viral, and it's highly likely to be due to diabetes. However, um, the discoloration, it could be a variety of colors. So it could be gray, black, green. It could be this yellowish color. It could be white. And so one would need to see a professional that's able to make this diagnosis and not all medical doctors are skilled at making this diagnosis. Um, and sometimes it requires a little more testing and what I would say about this too, is that a lot of people go around looking for a doctor to write them a prescription for Diflucan or for, for some other anti-yeast uh, medication that they can get their insurance to cover and it comes from the pharmacy. However, these antifungals have to be taken for a long period of time and they have a lot of side effects. They basically are very toxic to the liver. So first of all, one needs to have normal liver function. And if you have diabetes, even though it's not showing up on the lab work, it's likely that you have fatty liver. Diabetes starts with fatty liver, 
which doesn't show up in the lab work until later, you would have to have an ultrasound to see if you have fatty liver. Now doctors are becoming more aware, but I've been through my whole career of doctors, especially primary care, not being aware that this is a chicken before the egg, the fatty liver comes first. And I saw people dying of fatty liver when I was a resident in internal medicine um, that was poorly diagnosed. So they didn't get diagnosed until they were in stage. Most fatty liver in the United States is not due to alcohol. Uh, that fatty liver and cirrhosis that ensues as a result of fatty liver is the result of uh, carbohydrates and sugars in the diet and the poor control or the overwhelming of the liver with those sugars. If we have chronic inflammation, our liver is being exposed to a lot of blood sugar, like all the time, and is having trouble handling it. So we can resolve this nail problem in holistic medicine or in functional and integrative medicine, uh, using other means is still going to take several months. Um, and normally when I treat it, it's going to be a layered therapy. However, if you don't get the blood sugar under control, i.e. the A1C has to be in the normal range. It has to be reversed. The diabetes has to be reversed. And the, the blood sugar has to be in the normal range. And I have a certain cutoff that I'm looking for. I want to see it as close to five as possible, the A1C. I want to see the blood sugar fasting be under 85. And um, things like the LDL cholesterol and the CRP all need to be normal. Okay. So we have lots of people that are looking for a miracle cure with uh, anti-yeast medication like Nystatin or like uh, Diflucan. However, if you're sitting there with a A1C of six, the fungus and the yeast have plenty of food to eat, so they are gonna come back. It's just gonna move to another part of the body. Most likely it'll be in a digestive system, but it's going to come back. And you will see like in the nails that it'll be in a corner. It doesn't completely go away. So that is that. All right. So next here, now this is a typical picture. And I, this is ingrained in my mind from when I did my residency in internal medicine, because I rotated through the Jocelyn diabetes, which is part of the Harvard um, uh, hospital system. It's a specialty hospital for diabetes. And I rotated through that Jocelyn diabetes um, probably at least six months during my residency of three years in internal medicine. I trained at the Deaconess Beth Israel. And um, as you know, Harvard has a number of hospitals that are right there in Boston on the Harvard uh, campus, the medical campus. And um, so I saw diabetics who were children all the way up to elderly and um, even though I wasn't being taught this in, I did a dermatology re uh, rotation also when I was at Deaconess, we weren't being so much taught uh, the skin findings in internal medicine. But when I rotated in dermatology, I came to the understanding that some of these skin changes were from diabetes. And I got accustomed to seeing it because I saw so many diabetics that were poorly controlled. So what you see here, this problem uh, person has some vascular disease. It looks like a kind of varicose vein situation showing up with, uh, you can see these dark spots. Um, however, there's also some paleness to the foot. There's also these hammer toes that I talked about. There's also nail changes going on here. Looks like there's sores that are coming up and healing, and then they become sores again. And that's likely what's going on on the shin here. A lot of times you'll see, it looks like the person has had multiple traumas scratches, bruises, uh, the skin is thinning. 
Uh, these are all changes that we see in diabetes. This person also has lower extremity swelling that's involving the foot ankle going up the leg. The skin is shiny. Um, like I said, they've got the hammer toes and a, and a couple of toes, a few toes. Also, you can see some contraction of the arch here, which means they have some tightening on the bottom of the skin of the foot. Um, probably if we looked at x-rays, we're starting to see some degeneration in the ankle joint itself. And uh, eventually without good innervation and without circulation, a person will develop what we call Charcot foot. That's spelled C-H-A-R-C-H, wait a second, C-H-A-R-C-H-O-T, and that's foot. It's like a French uh, name uh, of a, a medical person in the past that they named this after. But Charcot means that the foot is becoming denervated um, and that will affect the autonomic nervous in the foot and the foot loses tone. And you can see people walking around with the uh, high arches initially, but then eventually there's degeneration of the ankle joint itself and the feet start to roll in. So you can see all stages of this uh, with people. Sometimes people that are like this aren't able to wear shoes. Uh, you can see here that this is abnormal, the way this is shaped. The sole of the foot um, has lost tone and it's pressing into uh, the floor where they have their foot. It's important when you're doing foot care to have stand on some kind of mat like this um, so your feet are protected. Sometimes there's pieces of, gl of glass or nails or things that are on the floor that are sharp that can puncture the bottom of the foot. So if you have this type of foot, you need to be very protective. You need to be examining your foot every day um, to make sure that nothing's happening because you're probably not sensing when something's happening. So this is this, this is a diabetic foot. And you see that the toenails, they become very thick. And on this example, the toenails are white. You can see the thickness of the great toe toenail. And there are specialized um, people that do foot care for diabetics and they will address uh, these toenails and they can get them to heal without even um, healing or giving um, anything to go against the fungus. They can be healed uh, topically. So if you need help with that, you need to get a team and I can be on your team. I'm here for hire. So, and you can uh, call me for a consultation and, um, we can get you started. All right. So this one, you've seen athlete's foot. Most people know what it looks like, uh, but this you can see that this person's toenail is also affected because the fungus in the toenail is affecting the skin. Um, this is something that initially it may look like dry, crusty stuff. When it's wet, this is what it looks like. I'll just play it one more time so you can see the toenail and you can see uh, between the toe what it looks like there. All right. So I showed all these photos because I'm hoping that I'm hitting some areas that are common to people. And these are things that I commonly see, commonly signs that the blood sugar is out of control. In order to be classified as diabetes, um, any states has got somewhere between a six and a 6.4, the A1C. Um, however, you don't want to wait until you get to a six or a 6.4 higher. You want to, if your blood sugar A1C, which is the hemoglobin A1C, if that is above the normal range, you want to start taking some action because that 
means that you have insulin resistance. And the majority of people that have diabetes in the United States have insulin resistance that has gotten worse and worse over the years. So I mean, you need to get help, right? So we need to build a team. We need nutrition. Now, the traditional nutrition or diabetic tells diabetics that they can eat anything. And if you want to continue to follow that type of uh, advice and you're in denial, um, I would tell you that that's going to run out soon. <laughs> Functional nutrition, integrative nu nutrition is where you want to go. You want to be paying attention to your macros, your carbohydrates, your fats, Um most people are deficient in many minerals, especially if you've been taking diabetes medications, you're deficient in minerals, you're deficient in B vitamins, probably antioxidants. So there's a not a lot that done. It is not going to be replaced in one day. We need to work with someone who understands this type of nutrition. I understand this type of nutrition from working many years, excuse me, with diabetes and diabetics to help people to reverse their diabetes. All right, and then, uh, and I've helped hundreds of people to reverse their diabetes and to get these situations improved. All right, so we need to stop smoking cigarettes. So imagine that you have this condition and that in the feet and in the hands, you have narrowing of the capillaries and of the small blood vessels. And then you're smoking on top of that. So you've got a blood vessel that's narrowed. And then when you smoke and nicotine's action is to further narrow that blood vessel. And nicotine will start acting as soon as you start smoking and it can last for a half a day. They've done studies, they know this, that it has a long half-life and it can hang around. And when the blood vessels are stiff, it takes longer for that blood vessel to relax, let the blood through. So I'm just telling you the physiology, I'm not making this stuff up. There are studies that prove all of this, which is why surgeons don't want to do surgery on you when you're a smoker, right? And a lot of people will like kind of fudge and tell the surgeon that they stopped smoking like yesterday. And then the surgeon will schedule their surgery like two weeks out because the surgeon doesn't want to deal with the smoking. Um, and we know that people aren't going to heal properly when they're smoking and when they have surgery. We also know that when they have diabetes, when they're smoking, it's like a death wish. You're, you're basically... Um, your body has no, it can't, it can't, uh, recover from a pandemic that the recommendations that we were making out alcohol before were not correct. And that, uh, our bodies tolerate much less alcohol than what we thought before. And I suspect that some of this has changed over the tw past 20 years because of the terrible, terrible quality of food that we have in the United States. It's just gotten worse and worse. It's gotten more, what they call ultra processed, and that this ultra processed food is challenging our systems. Our liver cannot handle all of these carbohydrates, especially the simple ones. Alcohol has a lot of grains involved with the production of alcohol, even wines, which should be all grapes, are no longer all grapes. Even when you get it from other countries, unfortunately, graduates of like uh, the universities in California that teach wine making across the world are teaching the cheap methods in which they use grains to clarify the wines. So I advise, and also alcohol is more like an empty calorie and it ends up making the blood sugar go up later. Like if you're looking at your blood sugar right around eating, it's not really affecting that, but it will affect the blood sugar later on, hours later. We need to get foot care. We need to get, uh, and podiatry has a role in that. I met, I mentioned there are specialized 
people that do pedicures that are able to um, handle this situation with the fungal nails. Um, exercise is important. Exercise is something uh, that is a bit miraculous, but people don't realize how miraculous it is for correcting our metabolic function. Especially for diabetics, it's going to be uh, weightlifting or um, strength training. It's also going to be um, walking is going to be one of the most beneficial. Um, if you have a more, more advanced diabetic foot, you may want to uh, get prescribed for pool therapy or um, working with a physical therapist um, to try to then uh, eat and to try to, to get the circulation established or better in the feet. Um, sometimes physical therapists will prescribe like for people to use a whirlpool um, or get paraffin therapy. There are different modalities that may help uh, with the foot. Um, I mentioned the nail and skin care. This is essential, essential, essential. I uh, mentioned that I used to be a medical director in a hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy treatment unit, and we had several of the chambers where we would dive pace. And the purpose of hyperbaric oxygen, like I said, is limb salvage. So it's able to increase the oxygen level in the blood, which, which helps the blood vessels to grow new blood vessels or new connections to reestablish um circulation. This takes at least, I would say, six to eight weeks to happen. And usually, if there are wounds, uh, insurance will usually pay for people to get hyperbaric oxygen if they have diabetic foot and if the wounds are serious enough to indicate it. I probably should have listed your wound care because a lot of people have with diabetes foot have uh, wounds that are not healing. If you go to a wound care specialist, uh, they can help you. Some hospitals have a nursing unit that do that. Some hospitals have hyperbaric um, services they can offer. Um, some of the nursing homes also have wound care. Um, sometimes the visiting nurses to people's homes have wound care. So there are many ways to get the wound care um, if you have diabetic foot and if your foot's critical like that. Um, there's also infrared therapies. And I see a lot of chiropractors, um, these units like out in the community, they have it in their offices. Um, sometimes they have you come to the office to get the infrared therapy, which helps the circulation. Sometimes they have you purchase a unit, which they'll rent to you for a certain amount of time. Um, and there are home units now because we know the infrared there has so many benefits. Um, there are also companies that make these units that you can set up in your home. Uh, you have saunas with infrared. There is a variety of ways. Um, but if you have diabetic foot, some of this needs to be supervised because um, you're going to need to know, you know, since you don't have sensation in your you need to know that temperature is being checked and that you're burning the skin on foot. Okay. So I'm just going to next run through uh, some slides that I had on a past uh, presentation uh, because I know a lot of people uh, debate uh, whether diabetes can be reversed. Believe me, I've helped hundreds of people reverse diabetes, even people that were on 400 units of insulin a day um, and were told that they would never get off of it. I can help those people. People that have type one diabetes um, have, we all, all these types of diabetes are autoimmune. However, type one has autoimmune diabetes to where their pancreas has been pretty much completely destroyed. Insulin sensitivity of the tissues can be improved, however. So, and that's what I learned when I was at uh, Jocelyn Diabetes is that 
just eating, telling people that they can eat anything and they can just increase their insulin. This is a formula for disaster because you're, you're, they're setting themselves up for insulin resistance. And we really want to increase the sensitivity of the tissues to the insulin. So I have seen type ones uh, be able to increase their um, dependent on insulin by decreasing the number of units that they're taking a day, um, both with exercise, sometimes, um, you know, finding the best unit for delivering insulin inside the body so that they can tightly control the blood sugar throughout the day and uh, not having to dose more and more in each time. So balanced diet is definitely huge. And balanced diet is huge for everything, basically. Um, and, you know, staying hydrated and getting the proper minerals, um, Drinking moderately, we have to talk about what that means because of people think that drinking moderately means that they can drink every day and they can drink, you know, one, two drinks. And the recommendations have changed. So we need to talk about from person to person what that is. All right. And we already talked about exercise and these are examples. I did mention uh, the training as being a really good modality. Um, prioritizing mental health. This is another, this is probably the top area where I see problem, people having challenges. And I, what I've seen in my experience in practice is that anybody can do any diet plan and any exercise plan for about six weeks. And then at that point, when the mental health, if you have not addressed it, they will go the person will go back to the previous lifestyle, which was unhealthy. We expect that everybody got the wagon, right? Everybody does, um, or they set themselves up to fail uh, temporarily. But in order to get back on the wagon, we have to address mental health because you have to have a connection to your motivation for being healthy. I am self-motivated to stay healthy. Some people, it's they want to take care of a pet. Some people have kids they want to take care of. Some people are in a marriage and they have a spouse they want to take care of. I enjoy being healthy, being able to run races. I enjoy being able to garden and enjoy nature. I really enjoy enjoying nature. If I'm not healthy, I can't walk outside and in nature. So that's my motivation. I have a niece and nephew that I like to see. I have relatives that I like to see periodically. I would like to be in the best health so that I am able to get to them and uh, they are able to get to me. Quality sleep, this can also be very challenging for people that have diabetes because diabetes is going to affect the hormones negatively. It takes three to six months to really get the hormones back on track. So quality sleep, we need to talk one-on-one -on -one to figure out what your sleep challenges are and how it's affecting your whole systems and whether it's a disorder because one of the most one things that I see is people have a sleep disorder and it has not been diagnosed or addressed. Prevention is key. All these things that I mentioned, stress management, avoiding harmful habits are all important. I mentioned quitting smoking before. When you know the theology is pretty much a brain, uh, a no-brainer. And then taking your vitamins well. I would say it's, you know, replenishing what you're deficient in. If you've been taking metformin or insulin and or other medications for diabetes, you have built in deficiencies. Some doctors are recognizing this. They tell people to take vitamins. A lot of people 
are like overwhelmed and they don't understand why they're taking vitamins or minerals. And so they don't see it as important and maybe they'll take it for six weeks. So like I said, when the mental, emotional, spiritual is not in balance, it gets tossed to the side, <laughs> unfortunately. So why listen to me? Remember I said that I rotated at the Jocelyn Dietes uh, when I was in internal medicine residency. I love um, this aspect of endocrinology. Um, I love helping people to recognize that they can take care of their health just using um, nutrition and addressing nutritional deficiencies and addressing toxicities. I didn't even get into toxicities, but that's part of the whole picture of health too. And um, when you've been taking medications, you've basically been taking toxins. I do use medications for some people. I'm an integrative doctor, so I combine um, medication and nutrients wherever it's optimizing the person's health. Some people don't want to change their diet this is unfortunate, but these are people that we have to be realistic. They're going to need medication. Now we have more medications to choose from more than ever. We have the GLP-1s, which are peptides, which are really helpful. They do have side effects. All medications have side effects. I am a medical doctor. Um, I had boards in internal medicine. I have current boards in physical medicine and rehab. So I know how to de-prescribe. I have a lot of experience with helping people get off of insulin and off of um, medications for diabetes. Um, there are not that many of us out here, but it can be done. Most of you that are on medications cannot do this cold turkey. So do not stop your medications based on what you think um, you need to have uh, lab work to assess where you are, and you also need someone to work with someone who has experience at deprescribing. Um, usually, with diabetes is more complicated. Diabetes medicine, you have the the basically it's like the the prescribed trilogy of the cholesterol medications are the sentence. You're usually on an ACE inhibitor, like a lisinopril or something that ends in pill um, for both blood pressure prevention and treatment, prevent damage to kidneys when you're spilling protein into your urine. And then you have the medications like metformin. Um, there are other medications that are used to control blood sugar. There are the insulins. And then now we have the GLP-1s. So these are all tools. Um, there are herbals, there are homeopathics uh, that can be used uh, also. But the main idea that we need to have in our mind is that we want to have a lifestyle that lowers our sugar as much as possible. So we don't have to take things to lower our blood sugar. All right, so if you have questions, like I said, post it here. I know there's a longer video, um, but uh, hopefully I covered a lot of things that maybe you haven't heard about regarding diabetic feet. So have a great day. And like I said, if you're interested in getting in touch with me for help, um, my website is treatyourselftohealth.com. If you put in treatyourselftohealth.com backslash schedule, uh, you'll be going directly to the schedule page and you can, if you have labs, if you have some data, you can schedule a half hour. If you um, just wanna have a short phone conversation, either me or one of my assistants, We'll talk to you for 10 minutes on the phone and you can sign up for that. Um, so hopefully uh, I provided some good information. Please subscribe. Please uh, post your questions. Please come back for more. I'm going to talk about more issues about diabetes later. Thank you.